God, for that we give you glory. We give you praise, God. We believe, oh Lord Jesus, and we receive your grace, oh God. We receive your love, oh God. Now receive our praise, oh God, as we, Lord God, praise the God of our salvation, the God of our lives. Father, we ask all of these things, oh God, lifting up that name, that name that has given us all that hope. Hallelujah. The son of suffering, you know it all, God. You know, Lord God, what we experience, oh Lord God, and you, Lord God, bind up our wounds, oh Lord God, with your love and with your everlasting arms. We give you glory and we ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise right now? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I want to share uh, what the Lord put on my heart today. We've been doing a, a series based on truths found and guidance from the Lord's Prayer. But before we uh, do the Lord's Prayer, and before my son completely falls apart behind me, <laughs> I want to tell you a little story about my father. Uh, those of you that have heard me speak about my father before, my father was a character um, just so enjoyed him uh, for the 93 years that he spent on this earth. He passed away in 2021. But um, I've told you many times my dad was a disciplinarian. He disciplined me. Um, he did not play. Um, I, I had the fear of God for my father, but at the same time, uh, you know, when he would come home from work, I'd run into his arms but I knew that I couldn't play when it came to him. But before he got saved, he got saved when I was about 15 years old. Before he got saved, he was an alcoholic, uh, a functioning one. He used to kind of just medicate during the week and come Friday and Saturday completely plastered. And he would, he would not get mean. What he would do, he'd get very embarrassingly silly. And when my dad was uh, drunk, I wasn't afraid of him anymore. And I would reach into his pockets. I'd take money. I'd, you know, say whatever I wanted to say. I knew he's not going to remember anyway. So one day he came home, and he had been drinking. And uh, I, I miscalculated I thought he was drunk, but he was uh, what Puerto Ricans say, picao, which means he was just buzzed. And what I did was I called my father a drunken bum. And when I realized that he was not drunk was when his face started to turn beet red and I don't know if you've seen the cartoons where smoke starts coming out of their ears. He started smoldering like a volcano about to erupt. And I knew that my life, my little life, so breathe on the earth, was over. But, you know, when you grow up in a Hispanic uh, household, well, it used to be that way. I don't know how it is now. When your parents or your father spoke to you, you couldn't even look at them. You had to put your head down, because if you looked at them, they took that as an affront, like you're, you know, you're fronting with them. And, and also, you better not run, because if you run and they catch you, you'll get it worse. Well, I didn't care about that. I was a runner. <laughs> I was a runner, and I would run. So the chase started. I knew I was running for my life. I mean, for my life, I knew that my father was in such a state that he, could, he was going to do some permanent damage. So I had one thing that I always used to do when I got my father angry. If I can escape and run fast enough and get into the bathroom, I would close the door, and then I would put the mop from the door to the tub as like, you know, to, to, to block the door, and then he could never get in. So 
the chase was on. I, first I hit, he took out his belt and he started swinging wildly. I went to hide behind my mom and so she, her legs were getting what I should have got. <laughs> and all, cross tables, flying over chairs, knocking over all the furniture. I dove into the bathroom. I got the mop down just in, before he started to push the door. But this time, he had never done this, he started to ram against the door. And I heard the mop go like this. Crack, crack, crack. And I think two or three more times, and he would have broken that mop, and I wouldn't be here standing talking to you today. But he gave up. And then he went to bed, and he slept it off. And I, 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 to me, I don't know because I was a little boy, but it seemed like I stayed in there like three hours. I was not coming out. Finally, after a long, long time, I opened the door, and he was asleep. And, uh, you know, the next morning, he just gave me a bye. He just, you know, I guess he slept it off or whatever. But how horrible, right, that no matter what my state, state my dad was in, that I would go to the level of losing reverence for him or respect for him. Um, I think about that, and I, th th there's a certain amount of uh, uh, respect that you expect a child to have for their parents, correct? And how is it that you feel when you see a little child or a young child just totally disrespecting their, their mother or father? Don't you want to jump in there and say, hey, hey let me help you out with that? <laughs> it, it just doesn't feel right because it's not. So I want to talk to you about that particular topic. We are reading from the Lord's Prayer. If you could put it up, I'd like for us to read it together. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Many of you know it by heart. A lot of you know the King James Version, which we all grew up, if you're, uh, you know, in my age category. But let's read what's on the screen there together. It's the Lord's Prayer. Is it ready? Here we go. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we've spoken about when we pray, that's the first thing. This then is how you should pray. We spoke about our Father in heaven, the fatherhood of God. And the next section says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. We're going to talk about the blessing of reverencing God. Hallowed means holy. It means sacred. It means revered. It means to regard with reverential respect. And if you just do a little YouTube uh, search throughout, uh, you, uh, you know, if you're looking for people who are worshiping or whatever, you'll see many times things that look like there's no reverence for God. Like you don't know who you're supposed to be worshiping. Reverence today has lost uh, its meaning or people forget you know, sometimes I see people do things, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, have they no fear of God? But I want to talk to you about that, because when there is a lack of reverence for God, also known as the fear of the Lord, it's because people do not really know or understand who God is. Because if they did understand that, they would have a lot of reverence and awe. First thing I want to talk to you about today is that God calls us to reverence him. He tells us to reverence him. Just like my dad expected me to respect him and many lessons I learned the hard way of him telling him that I should do that and why. God calls us to reverence him. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 5 starting in verse 22. This is what the Lord says. Should you not fear me, declares the Lord. Should you not tremble in my presence? 
I made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say to themselves, let us fear the Lord our God who gives autumn and spring rains in season, who assures us of the regular weeks of harvest. Your wrongdoings have kept these away. Your sins have deprived you of good. So we need to, we should reverence the Lord. We should have a healthy fear of the Lord. Let me tell you why we should reverence him or why we do. We reverence him because he is God above all things. How many say amen? There's no one higher than God. You know, in in this country, we have a system of courts from the lower courts to the I get a kick out of the lower courts, especially when you go to traffic court. Anybody here been to traffic court? You know, raise your hand if you've been to traffic court. The judge in traffic court thinks like he's a Supreme Court judge. <laughs> mean as all get out. You know, you can't even talk sometimes. I've done a couple of times, you know, because I have been accused of speeding. Could you believe that? <laughs> and so... Uh, there's all kinds of systems of courts, and then there's a court of appeals, and each state has a system. But then how many know that there is the Supreme Court? And the Supreme Court, their decisions, they negate any other decision. They can turn something around. They can change what some other lower court did, and it's a big to-do. But, but God is... More supreme than that. that. That's a joke compared to how high God is above everything. He's the God who created everything. We're breathing because he has willed it to be so. Psalm 97.9 says this, For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. How many say Amen. So we reverence him because he is above all things. We reverence him because he is awesome in power. How many know God's power is unfathomable? The fact that he can speak and things are created. He spoke the world into existence. I love looking at the stars at night. You can ask my wife. I, I, I pull out my little app and I start pointing. I could pick out Jupiter now. You know, you can see Jupiter at night and, and during this season. I know which one it is. I can point. There it is. It's amazing to me. And this thing that's about 300, this star, or 300 or more million miles away, I can see the light from that star. And God put it there. Why did he put it there? Because he's God and he can. He's awesome in power. Genesis 17, 1, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. That's where we get the name El Shaddai. El Shaddai means God Almighty. There's nobody mightier than God. There's nobody stronger than God. There's nobody more powerful than God. He, everything pales in comparison. Things that we're afraid of. Satan trembles at the name of Jesus. How many say amen? We reverence him because he is God over all. And there's nothing that he can't do. How many know that? Nothing he can't do. I know we have a hard time understanding that because there are a ton of things that are impossible for us to do. But for God, there's nothing impossible. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask you right now to be the witnesses today. If God has done something that is impossible for you in your life, would you raise your hand and give testimony to the Lord? Look around. Look around. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. He proves himself. <laughs> Jeremiah 32, 27. I have scripture for you today because scripture speaks a lot better than I can. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? It's a rhetorical question. You know what the answer is? No, Lord, nothing is too hard for you. I'm so glad that that's true because no matter what I'm facing, you know what always gets me out of my mental jam when I'm afraid of something or something happens? Wait a minute, but then there's God. 
This looks like the end, but there's God, and nothing is impossible for him. He can do anything. Amen? He's God over all. Nothing too hard. Then he also is our maker. How many know God made you? If you're sitting here today, breathing, God made you and he willed for you to be sitting here breathing. How many know he sustains all life? He sustains your breath. The breath in our lungs come from the breath of God. Psalm 100 verse 3, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He owns us because he made us. How many say amen? Some people don't like that. Some people rebel against that. You can rebel all you want. Like I said, you don't know about the fear of God. You don't have to like that. It's just a fact. He made you and me and we belong to him. Amen? So God calls us to reverence him. The second thing I want to share with us is that a right relationship with God begins with reverencing him. You're not going to have a good relationship or a right relationship with the Lord without reverencing him. Because reverencing him will lead you to do certain things. First of all, it will lead you to honor him. Right? I... Uh, as I'm doing today, and I'm talking to my dad, I, I respected my dad very, very, till the end of his life. And I, I honor him for what he did in my life and what he taught me. But compared to God, I mean, I thank God for my human father, yes, but my heavenly father, how can I not honor him? How can I not honor the God who has watched over me and had so much... So much mercy. How many here are with me? You thank God for the mercy that he has showed us in our life. This, this room is full of a bunch of pieces of work, starting with the guy back here behind this pulpit. And God's mercy is why we're still here. Amen? Amen. Reverencing him leads to honoring him. It leads to being grateful or to have a grateful attitude towards him. And, and you know that, that grateful attitude, I was just doing a little search, I just got curious. I knew more or less, but if you do, you know, people like science, right? They say, show me the science. If you do a little science research on what a grateful heart does and uh, uh, magnify that to a grateful heart to the Lord, It brings health, mental health, heart health. It improves relationships. It just, you can go right down the line of all the awesome things. But when you reverence God, you are grateful. You become a grateful person. Your eyes are open to why you should be grateful to our God. That's what what keeps me in line and in check because How many, like me, you know who you were before Jesus got a hold of you? Raise your hand if you know who you were. And we're not the same, are we? The Bible says that we're a new creation. We got a do-over. Praise God. I got a do-over. God says, okay, that now is under the blood now that you've received my son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, of your life. Now you start with a fresh, clean slate. And you could keep it fresh and clean because of the blood of Jesus. How many say amen? Amen. It leads you, reverencing God, the fear of the Lord, leads you to obey his commandments. You know, a lot of people have the wrong view of obeying God's commandments. If you are sad about having to obey God's commandments, you don't understand God's commandments. If it's heavy for you to 
obey God's commandments, you have no clue why they're there. Because when you get an inkling of why God wrote them, he didn't write them for himself. God doesn't need me for anything. He doesn't need me to obey him. I must because he's God and because I should. But the reason he gave us those commandments is so that we can live. Because they keep us from our nasty, sinful nature that you know how it is. You tell me how insane you were before Jesus Christ got a hold of your life. Did you do things that you know, that you knew were no good and that would lead to no good and that would lead to trouble? You knew it was no, you knew, oh man, this is not going to be good, and you still did it. Why are you looking at me that? You think I'm the only one? How many know what I'm talking about? You knew, I knew. We might have even cried about it the day after. And then you did it again. Listen to what God says in Deuteronomy 5.29. Listen to the cry of his heart. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always. Why, God? So that it may go well with them and their children forever. There it is. Why? So that it will go well with you. I've never met anybody in my life, nor do I ever expect to meet anybody who obeyed the commandments of God and were sorry about it. Never once have I met anybody like that. But disobeying, oh my goodness, we got stories, don't we? Maybe we'll have a service like that one day when we get up and say every, all the time we disobeyed. I think not. We're not going to have that service. <laughs> I won't come. <laughs> you know, the Bible tells us that when Jesus prayed, our Heavenly Father listened to him because of his reverent submission, his reverence. It says deep reverence for God, deep reverence. And, and he learned obedience, this incredible passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 5. He learned obedience through suffering. Wait a minute, Jesus had a deep reverence for God and learned obedience through suffering? Where does that leave me? What do I need to learn? What do I need? First of all, I need to have a deep reverence for God. And when time of suffering comes, i got to cling to him. There's a, a verse of scripture that says, as a loincloth clings to a man's waist, so I cling to God. And that's what I've learned to do. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you start reading that book, Solomon will take you on a wild roller coaster ride. This is the man who has a reputation of being the smartest, the most wise man who ever lived. But we get to see that wisdom that's not in, in the control of God, that can be a horrible thing. And you read all of these things that he went through. All He tried everything under the sun. And he went off and he did what God told him not to do. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Or is it 700 wives or 300 concubines? One of those, it's 1,000. They both add up to 1,000. I'm trying to figure out the one I have. Not because she's off, I'm off. I can't figure her out. I had to do that to fix it because I need to go home later. <laughs> Pray for me, people. She was back there. I thought she was in the other room. Now, my wife is a, a tremendous blessing to me, but can you imagine? He just went off. He just went off. And then at the end of... Ecclesiastes, the last chapter, the last two verses, especially the one before, he says, this is what I figured out. Ready? This is what everybody should do. Fear God and serve him. That's, that's what men should do. That's what people should do. It's the duty of mankind. Fear God and keep his commandments. I'm thankful that God has so much patience with us. Reverencing God will help you to obey those commandments. Reverencing God will also lead you to love him. Did you know that you won't love what you don't respect? 
If you don't respect someone, it's very difficult to love that person. If you reverence and fear the Lord, it will lead to you loving him because God will begin to open up the eyes of your heart to see who he is. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says this, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask for? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord with your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. To fear God is to have a deep reverence for him and to stand in awe at his holiness and majesty and his power and his love. I'm so thankful. You know, I, you know, I think a lot of things. My mind also always is pondering things. And I was thinking, what if God was God like he is? There's only one God. But what if he didn't love? What if he, uh, you know, I... I, I traveled to other countries and I've seen and seen temples where they worship, you know, idols and statues. Have you ever seen them? Have you seen how ugly they are? They, they have these... And you're praying to this thing that's like, like, I'm about to kill you. Right? And you're praying to this thing. Imagine for one moment that the God who's all powerful, who's above everything, what if He didn't love us? What if He didn't care about us? What if He just made us for sport? <laughs> Thank God that's just, just a little thought in my mind. Thank God that He is who He is. As a matter of fact, His love, I can't even grasp. Can you grasp the love of God? Can you grasp his patience? Can you grasp what he does for us? Can you grasp what he allowed us to do to him on the cross? Can you grasp that? The God who made us all powerful and what he allowed us to do just so that he can save you and me. Reverencing God will lead you to have a right relationship with him. Amen? Reverencing God keeps you from wrong choices and wrong paths. How many want to stay off wrong choices and wrong paths? Raise your hand if that's you. Well, reverencing God, having the fear of God will help you do that. The fear of God will guarantee that he will guide your life. Because you will submit yourself to him. And it will guarantee that the decisions of your life, he will be Behind them, how many have learned to pray, God, not my will, but your will be done? And some people haven't learned to pray that. I learned to pray that because of all of the dumb de decisions that I made in my life, all the wrong choices. When I make decisions on my own, I am truly rolling the dice, and it's usually not good. And I found out I don't have to do that. God knows what's going to happen, and he knows what's best for me. He knows what path I should take. And when you fear the Lord, it will guarantee his guidance. Psalm 25, 12 says, Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. How many, how many want to be instructed in the way you should go? Raise your hand. Of course. The fear of the Lord will keep you from sin and wickedness. There's people who struggle to stay straight and get away from the things that bring you down. The word of God, Proverbs 16, 6, through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. I want to fear the Lord. I want to stay far away from evil because evil comes from the evil one. And if you don't know it yet, he's out to destroy you and me. He hates us with a hatred that you have no idea about. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. Amen? Amen. And the fear of the Lord will keep you from death. Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life turning a person 
from the snares of death. A fountain of life. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ that keeps you from the snare of death. Timothy, come. I want to finish with this last point. Because the fear of the Lord leads to a lot of things. But the Bible is full of verses and passages of Scripture that say that the fear of the Lord leads to many, many blessings. It leads to untold blessings. And I want to live in the blessing of God. How about you? Psalm 128, 1 to 2 says this, Blessed, which means happy, are those who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Let's just talk about a few of them. The the fear of the Lord, first of all, leads to wisdom. How many need a little bit more wisdom in your life? Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I love that verse, and I was thinking a nice way to put this. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To not fear the Lord is idiotic. Because, you know, I see people all the time, and uh, I, I don't know what they're thinking, but, you know, people who don't, don't not only don't know the Lord, but they've, they've taken a position of that they're going to try to put him down. I saw this video of a guy doing just that, just spouting idiocy, a little pee talking against the God of heaven and earth, spouting evil and lies about our God, as if one day he wouldn't have to face him. It's lunacy, isn't it? I mean, God is patient in his love. You know how you know how much love God has? That while that guy's doing the video, he didn't just poof right out. You know, all you see is dust. You know how God is poof. That's what I would have done. (laughs) But no, he's there. And he's saying it. And there's a little video about it. Oh, he's going to face God one day. But I don't understand. It's pure lunacy and obviously a total lack of any common sense. Forget wisdom. But when you fear the Lord, wisdom, you you begin to think differently about things. You begin to be sober about certain things. Things that don't make sense, which you used to do before. You're like, wait a minute. That's not right. I'm not going to go in that direction. You might have wisdom for somebody else, not just for yourself. You might be able to tell somebody or counsel somebody. You ever talk to somebody and God gives you the words and you know they didn't come from you? It's the wisdom from the throne room of God. Amen? That's what's happened when you reverence the Lord. Also, there's the blessing of being on a certain foundation. It's a treasure that you're standing on solid ground. And that solid ground has nothing to do with what's happening around the world or what's happening in your life. I saw that couple, Olemge and Lexi, standing on solid ground where a lot of people would have been in quicksand. How many know what I'm talking about? Solid ground, a foundation. You know, we sing a song here that says, we will not be moved. No matter what happens in your life, when you're standing on the foundation that is Christ Jesus, no matter what comes against you, no matter what happens in this life, you will not be moved. It's a treasure that we have, and that comes when we fear the Lord. 
Isaiah 33, 6 says, He will be the sure foundation for your times. What times? When do you need a sure foundation where everything around you is quaking and shaking? But you're not. Why? Because you're on a sure foundation for your times. A rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. I, I have that treasure. How about you? I'm not special. It's just that I learn the fear of the Lord. And if you have it, you have that treasure. How many have the treasure of a sure foundation? Raise your hand and give glory to God. Hallelujah. By the way, when things happen in the world and they affect us too because we live here, we need to show the world our sure foundation. Because when they see that we're not moved or shaken, they're going to want to know who is this God that you serve. And we're going to be able to tell them about it. How many say amen? The fear of the Lord leads to the blessing of security for you and for your family. When I'm tempted to get afraid about something, how many know there's a lot of things that you can be afraid about? A lot of scary stuff happens. All it takes is a bill you cannot pay. Fear. Oh no, what do I do now? I don't have money for the rent. Oh no. What am I going to do now? But when you know the Lord is different because he made certain promises to us. But listen to this proverb. Proverb 14, 26. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. And listen. And for their children, it will be a refuge. Did you know if you have children still living under your roof, that haven't grown up and gone on their own, they will hide in the secure fortress that you have when you fear the Lord. I experienced that with my boys. Whenever something scary would do, before they learn how to do it on their own, the secure fortress that we had was a covering for them as well. And then one day they learned, hey, I can go there myself. I have a secure fortress now because I have the same Lord and Savior Jesus that my mom and dad have. I have him for me. I remember when my younger son, Timmy, was playing right now. He was facing, he was on his deathbed because for two and a half weeks he was in the hospital, burst appendix. And uh, he shouldn't have been alive. He shouldn't be alive, but God had mercy. And I remember him telling me these words. I'll never forget it. And he was fighting for his life. He said, before I relied on the faith that you and mom had on God. But now God is teaching me to have faith and rely on him for myself. How did he learn that? Through suffering. He learned some awesome truths because God took him there. He walked through the valley of the shadow of death, but was able to fear no evil because God was with him. Amen? Amen? Just two more. How about the blessing of life when you fear the Lord? Proverbs 19.23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. Notice it doesn't say that trouble won't touch you. It's so you'll be untouched by it. In other words, it won't mess with you. How I many know that trouble comes and trouble goes? But God is saying if you respect and reverence me, have the fear of the Lord, you will have life and trouble may come, but it won't rock you. And let me tell you about life, because you might say, wait a minute, what do you mean the fear of the Lord leads to life? I'm living right now. My question is, are you? The Bible says if you don't have Jesus, you're not alive. Oh, you're existing all right. 
You're breathing, but you don't have life. You know why? Because he is life. You're existing somewhere on the planet if you don't have Christ. But when you fear the Lord and you have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then your eyes are opened. I, I've had the wonderful privilege of seeing guys, uh, friends of mine, open their eyes for the first time to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and receiving him. What an awesome experience when somebody really has that. It's like, it's like you were blind and now you can see. You didn't see it before. You were living in this kind of dull, kind of no vision world, just trying to get by another day. And then one day, God reveals himself to you. And now you, now you have life and you, you're wondering, oh my goodness, it starts a life of, well, the song that Timmy sang, right? When you first come to Jesus, it, it's, it's awesome. And then you learn, you know, that life happens. We're still here. And we still got to go through things. But guess what? God is with you every step of the way. He leads to life. And I want to close with this. The fear of the Lord gives the blessing of a longer life. Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. And someone wants to say, well, I know a good guy, and he died when he was just 40 years old. It says it leads to a longer life. Maybe he was supposed to go at 20. And, and, and besides all of that, I always think of this. By the way, it keeps you from the wrong behavior that leads to a quick death, right? That's the first thing. Secondly, it leads to salvation, which increases your life by uh, an eternity, right? You went from zero to infinity in one fell swoop. But I was thinking about, I think about a lot of things. And I was thinking about heaven. You ever think about heaven? And so, you know, my mom and my dad, they're there. They were believers. My dad served the Lord until his last breath. And my mom was an incredible, she's the reason we're all serving Christ, because of her faith. She was a, a giant of the faith. And so they're in heaven right now before the throne of God. And I, I imagine it this way. How many know that heaven is outside of time? We know time. And, and to us, if I say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm going to give you something, but you're going to have to wait 30 years, Vaughn. And you go, oh, forget it. Don't give me nothing. 30 years? But the way I see it, if you're outside of time, I envision it this way. My mom passed away in 2012, and she went to be with the Lord. My dad lasted nine more years and then went to be with the Lord. I envision it this way, that mom is there, and all of a sudden, my dad pops up, and she goes, oh, I just got here too. And then one day, I'm going to be, and they go, oh, good, we're all here together. In other words, there's no time for, for, for people who are in glory. No one's thinking about, hey, I got to... I got to get there before nighttime. There is no nighttime. And there's no lamps. The light is the glory of God. Do you understand? Do you understand the inheritance that you and I have? It's unbelievable. But, it, it, you know, first of all, the enemy tries to block the glory that's ours as children of God. And then, of course, life's problems. We forget or, you know, we start worrying. I, I think about the things I've worried about. When you think about in light of eternity, psh, later for you, IRS. I hope I owe them a lot of money when God takes me home. <laughs> but what a wonderful thing it is when you fear the Lord. It's chock full of blessings. Because like I said, the fear of the Lord is reverence, is respect, is what we should have. And guess what? One day, the Bible tells us that every knee will bow in heaven, 
and on earth, and ready, under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now picture that. And what that's talking about is the people who wouldn't do it willingly. But when God chooses to reveal himself, knees are going to buckle. And everybody's going to hit the ground. And the God of all creation is going to make himself known. But we are the ones who didn't hold back our praise. We are the ones who, yes, we're fighting the good fight, right? Nobody is perfect. We're asking God to help us, but we're in it. We're on the road. And if we get knocked down momentarily, we get back up. The righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's close our eyes. The fear of the Lord is a beautiful thing. It's the only kind of fear we should have. All other fear is wrong. Perfect love casts out fear. If there's anybody here who, and maybe you haven't served God that way, you haven't thought of reverencing God, maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and if God is speaking to you today, I want to invite you to know him today. Those of you at home that are listening, and maybe you don't have a relationship with him, or maybe you lived a life like at one time I lived that really didn't speak much about how much I knew about Jesus, but God is so merciful. If God is speaking to your heart today and you want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, or if you walked away at one point, you were once, and you're coming back, I'd like you to raise your hand so I can know who you are. I want to pray with you. Anybody here who needs to make that decision, just raise your hand. I see your hand. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else that wants to live in the blessing of knowing the reverence for our Father? and you haven't been doing that, just raise your hand. God will see it. You at home, there, if, you, if God is speaking to your heart, would you, because he's watching, would you raise your hand? I can't see it, but he will, and he doesn't matter. Anybody else before we pray? If you raise your hand, either here at home to re receive Jesus Christ or come back to him, repeat these words after me, God will hear it. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Thank you for speaking to my heart today. Lord, I do want to live in the fear and admonition of the Lord and of your word. Lord Jesus, I, I believe with my whole heart that you are God. You are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. I believe in my heart, O oh God, and confess with my mouth that you died on the cross for the sins of the world, which include mine. And I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that you died and you rose on the third day, Lord God. You didn't stay dead. You're alive today, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I also know that I'm a sinner. I've done a lot of things wrong, and today I'm, I want to repent from that. I want to turn. I want to serve you in the fear and admonition of your word. Today, I give you my heart. I surrender my life in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for those that prayed that prayer with me. Father, I pray that you would surround them with your love, with your grace, with your mercy, and God, with guidance from this point on, oh God, so that they will follow you the rest of their days here on this earth, Lord God. We thank you for their lives in Jesus' name. With our heads still bowed and eyes closed, those of you that are here, you are disciples, well, I hope you are following Christ, but there are things that you need to get right before God. And God is calling on you right now to get some things straight just between you and him. If that's you and you want, because of the fear of the Lord, the wisdom of that, to just right now, just confess to the Lord. Just raise your hand. I want to pray with you too. I want to pray over you. Yes, I see your hands. Anybody else? Come on, raise your hands. Yes. I see your hands. You can put them down. I see your hands. Thank you. 
Father, thank you, Lord, for everyone that you're speaking to right now, oh, Lord God. Father, that we would all learn, oh, Lord Jesus, Lord, the fear of the Lord, which leads to many blessings, which leads to, Lord God, the right path, which leads to the right decisions, which leads to guidance, and most of all, it leads us to love you even more. God, I pray for special grace to those that are asking for it, oh God, that you would fill them, Lord God, with your Holy Spirit, Father, so that they will have what it takes, oh God, Lord, to follow, Lord, what your words have said, building their house on the rock, oh Lord God, so that, Lord, when the wind and the waves come, Lord God, that house will stand. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand. And can we give the Lord a thunderous ovation for how good he is to us? Amen.